and welcome to Some Random Guy Does Calculus, the most low-tech, low-budget, free calculus help you're ever going to find. I'm Some Random Guy, and I'm going to be taking a look at some of the hardest Calculus 1 topics that you're going to see. And in order to do that, what I'm going to be demonstrating is some problems that come out of James Stewart's Calculus Early Transcendentals, but it's the fourth edition. So if you're trying to follow along and you do have the calculus book uh, by Stewart, Early Transcendentals, and it's a later edition, maybe some of the numbers are different, but the math should be the same. Today what we're going to take a look at is the precise definition of a limit, which is section 2.4. And the goal is to demonstrate quite a few problems so you can kind of see how some of these problems are addressed. Anytime you're dealing with math, and really anytime you're dealing with calculus, it's kind of like learning a new language. And hopefully, by watching enough examples, you're going to see how we can use that language to interpret the idea that we're looking at. So the first thing we're talking about is the precise definition of a limit. And question 16 says, prove that the limit of x as it approaches 4 for 5 minus 2x equals negative 3. And the way that we do most of these precise definition of a limit is pretty much the same thing. So the first thing we do is we start with what is the actual definition of the limit. And what I have here is I have the shorthand for what the precise definition of a limit looks like. So we have a couple of random symbols in here and we're going to translate. So we have the upside down capital A. This is the logic shorthand for all. And these little bars just say that we're kind of separating things. So we have for all, this is the Greek letter epsilon. So for all epsilon greater than zero. Then we have the backwards capital E, and this means there exists. So there exists Greek letter delta. So there exists a delta greater than zero. ST is just such that X minus C less than delta. So what this means is absolute value in algebra, but when we're talking calculus, usually we talk about linear distance. So that is distance in one dimensions. So basically this is saying such that when the distance between x and c is less than this little number delta, this means that the distance between our function f of x and our limit l is less than our number epsilon. So this is the shorthand that I learned. This is the shorthand that I taught all my classes for a long way. And basically, anytime you're dealing with the precise definition of a limit, you just kind of have to memorize it. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that the distance x minus c, such that when x minus c is less than delta, this implies that f of x minus l is less than epsilon. It's a delightful little nursery rhyme that you can teach to your kids but there's really no way to answer these problems if you don't know the definition. So once we have the definition, we take our question 16 and we plug it in there. And in this case, you'll notice the for all epsilon greater than zero stays the same. There exists a delta greater than zero stays the same. But now we start plugging in some letters and some numbers. X minus C, well in this case C is whatever number we're approaching. So as x gets closer to c, the number we're approaching, that's going to be your x minus 4. So for x minus 4 less than delta, this implies our function f of x. Well, your function is whatever you're plugging, whatever your formula is, right? It's whatever uh, the thing that you would be graphing or whatever y equals a lot of times too. So our function is 5 minus 2x. So when f of x, 5 minus 2x minus and L is the limit. In this case, we were told our limit is negative 3. So 5 minus 2x minus negative 3 is less than epsilon. So step 1, we said what the definition was. Step 2, we plug in what our actual terms are for the definition, and that's just based off of what you're given. Now this is the hard part, and this is usually the place that most people are going to have difficulty figuring out what to do. And if you look at the f of x minus L, you can see, well, that can be cleaned up. And so that's what we start doing first. We start cleaning up f of x. So 5 minus 2x minus negative 3 is the same thing as 8 minus 2x, right? 5 minus negative 3 is positive 8. 
Then we start cleaning that up a little bit more because the goal is to somehow relate, relate this choice of delta so that it ends up looking like my f of x minus l. Usually, for most problems, that's going to end up some kind of factoring. So in here, 8 minus 2x, we see we can factor out a 2. And when we factor out a 2, we see, oh, there's our 4 minus x, which is very, very close to x minus 4. When we do a little bit of algebra, you can factor out a constant, right? So the 2 goes outside the absolute value. And then we can see on the right-hand side, absolute value of 4 minus x is just the same thing as x minus 4. So we can make it look the same. So all we did is clean up f of x minus l, factor out the 2, right? And then do a little algebraic identity, which says absolute value of a minus b is the same thing as absolute value of b minus a. So that's the right-hand side, and that's usually what we do. We just do some rough work to clean up f of x minus l. Well, once we've done that rough work, this tells us exactly what our choice for delta should look like. Because we know, just based off of what f of x and what l is, 2 times x minus 4 is always going to be less than epsilon. So that gives us a pretty good idea for how we can make x minus 4 look like epsilon. And so the first step, at least what I was always taught, and I think a lot of professors still teach this, is you have to fix epsilon greater than zero. This is just a very fancy way of saying, hey, give me any epsilon. Give me any positive number epsilon, and let's fix it. Let's say this is what epsilon is. For that choice of epsilon, we say choose delta less than epsilon over 2. So in other words, you give me a positive number, I'm going to pick a delta that's always half of that positive number. And when I pick that delta that's half of that positive number, because x minus 4 is always going to be less than delta, this is our condition, right, such that x minus 4 is less than delta, because this has to be less, I know that x minus 4 is less than epsilon over 2. So all I did was I took my choice of delta and I plugged it into the inequality that they gave us. And by doing that, x minus 4 is less than epsilon over 2. Well, if I multiply both sides of an inequality by positive 2, it stays the same. And look, what we have based off of our choice of delta is exactly what we did with our rough work in f of x minus l. And essentially, the proof is done. If I fix epsilon greater than 0, I choose a delta less than epsilon over 2, plug it into my inequality, plug it into my condition, I can show that based off of my choice of delta, I'm going to end up with f of x minus l, which is exactly what I needed to do to finish my proof, right? If you give me this x minus, if I know x minus c is less than delta, that tells me f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Now this is how I used to teach it. Basically, you just point the arrow so you didn't have to work the rough work again, but obviously stick to what your professor does. Now question 16 in the Stewart book said also graph out what's going on. And so this is kind of a picture. We know 5 minus 2x is a line. And so as x gets closer and closer and closer to 4, basically delta is just a boundary along the x-axis. Delta is saying, hey, you can go this little number to the right of x, and you can go this little number to the left of the x, it doesn't matter. So long as you're within that boundary, I'm always going to be within epsilon of my value for f of x and my l, which in this case is negative 3. So, so long as my function stays within delta of x equals positive 4, my y values right, where my actual graph is, is always going to be within epsilon. That's kind of the picture that we're looking at. Now, obviously, that's pretty much as clear as mud, right? It's not the most easy thing to kind of just pick up right away. So that's why we're going to do a few more examples. So we look on the next one in Stewart. Again, this is fourth edition. And so we have the limit of x as it approaches negative 1 for a function 3 minus 4x equals 7. Again, the way I always taught it, the way I was taught, the way I would encourage you all to do it too, 
is to start off by writing out your definition. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that x minus c less than delta implies f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Again, step two is always going to be the same. Plug in your values. In this case, c. Again, c is what x is approaching. c is negative 1. So we have x minus negative 1 less than delta. f of x, that's what my function is, 3 minus 4x. So my function, 3 minus 4x. And my limit, L, in this case, is 7. So I have 3 minus 4x minus 7 less than epsilon. Again, that's going to be the same thing every single one of these uh, proper definition of a limit. So once we have that, again, we do the same thing. That right-hand side, that 3 minus 4x minus 7, we have to do something that f of x minus L so we know what to choose for delta. In this case, 3 minus 4x minus 7 is negative 4 minus 4x, which is the same thing as negative 4 times x plus 1. And when I factor out the negative 4, right, absolute value of negative 4 is positive 4. Once again, now, I have, I have a pretty good idea of what my choice of delta is because this guy right here shows up in my x minus c. x minus negative 1, of course, is just x plus 1. That's going to happen for every single one of these. If this doesn't turn into some sort of factoring, or you can't get x plus c to show up in one of these problems, that usually means that your L is wrong. Or it's going to be one of the more complicated ones. you got to get a little bit more creative, and we're going to see some of those down the line. Then you'll notice, after I've done the rough work that shows me how I get my x minus c, step 1's the same. Fix epsilon greater than zero. And step two, choose delta less than epsilon over four. I know epsilon over four because four x minus c's are less than epsilon. So that means if delta is less than epsilon over four, right, it's going to work out. A little note here. I always choose delta less than my epsilon. You don't have to. Uh, I know that there are some books that teach delta equals epsilon over four. Either way works. You're talking the minusculest, uh, tiniest little sliver of a difference between equals epsilon over 4 and less than epsilon over 4. But I can guarantee you, you'll never get it wrong by saying choose delta less than epsilon over 4. The only type of delta you can't choose is you can't choose a negative delta, right? Because we're saying there exists some positive delta. There exists some positive distance from x. So once I have my choice of delta, again, I just plug it into my x minus c. So replace delta with my epsilon over 4. Because if delta is less than epsilon over 4, well, then I know that x minus c has to be less than epsilon over 4. And then once again, I'm just going to end up following my rough work I did there at the very beginning. And that's going to lead me back to my f of x minus l. So for these linear problems, it's just always going to be factoring out a constant. And in fact, you can even do uh, mx plus b equals the limit by just plugging in mx plus b. And you'll see that it's always going to end up being some sort of uh, choose delta less than epsilon over m. Uh, if your teacher gives you that kind of problem, they pretty much hate you. Or you go to a really, really good school, one, one or the other. Um, but... For these linear problems, it's always going to be the same type of steps. And again, if we take a look at what the picture looks like, once again, we're saying as x gets closer to negative 1, and if I go within delta of that negative 1, I'm always going to be within this epsilon box for what my y values are going to look like. Uh, my drawings suck. You're going to definitely see that as we uh, kind of see the other problems that come up. Take a look at question 20. Limit of x as it approaches 6 for x over 4 plus 3 equals 9 halves. Again, step 1, tried and true. For all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0, such that x minus c less than delta implies f of x minus l less than epsilon. It's just our definition again. Now we start plugging in our numbers for the definition, right? So the first number that goes in is c. We know x as it approaches 6, so that means c is going to be 6. f of x is x over 4 plus 3. And L, in this case, is 9 halves. And then once again, we start doing the same steps we did before. Let's clean up that F of X minus L. Cleaning up the F of X minus L. Uh, 3 is the same thing as 6 halves. 6 halves minus 9 halves is minus 3 halves. 
But notice in this case, it's a little bit different. We're not factoring out a four, we're factoring out a one fourth. So factoring out a one fourth from three halves, it leaves us with a six. So it's one fourth x minus six less than epsilon. So in this case, if you were to divide both sides by one fourth, dividing by one fourth is the same thing as multiplying by four. So we see why in this case, our choice for delta is gonna be four epsilon. Again, make sure to put this fixed epsilon greater than zero, uh, you know, given epsilon greater than zero, something like that. You just have to say, hey, give me some sort of positive epsilon. Once we get that positive epsilon, again, since delta is less than four epsilon, this is definitely less than four epsilon. And we see by the rough work, if I divide both sides by four, I get one fourth x minus six less than epsilon. And then again, the rough work on that side is gonna take me back to my f of x minus l less than epsilon. So again, all that's saying is, give me some positive number. I will then choose delta to be smaller than four times that positive number, no matter what it is. As long as x minus six is less than four times that positive number, I am guaranteed that f of x minus l is gonna be less than epsilon. Get our first really different one. We get 22, which is the limit of x as it approaches c, for x squared plus x minus 12 over x minus three, we wanna show that the limit is seven. This one is, if you graph it out, a straight line. It's the line x plus four, but there is a open circle at x equals three. Basically, it's a straight line with a, just a big gap at x equals three. So how do we deal with that? Notice it's gonna be different. Well, not really, because the first step is still the same. For all epsilon greater than zero, there's just a delta greater than zero, such that x minus c less than delta implies f of x minus l is less than epsilon. But when we plug in stuff this time, it's a little bit uglier. Notice c is pretty easy. c is just three. But f of x, well, now it's not quite so pretty. It's x squared plus x minus 12 over x minus 3 minus 7. Uh, L, of course, in this case is 7. But we still want to do what we can to clean it up. So in this case, in order to clean it up, we have to turn 7 into a rational function. So 7 is 7 over 1, and you would find a common denominator, which in this case is x minus 3. So you multiply top and bottom by x minus 3, which minus 7x... Uh, plus 21 over x minus 3. And then when I combine that into one fraction, I end up with x squared minus 6x plus 9 over x minus 3. And hopefully by this time you've seen enough of perfect squares to know x squared minus 6x plus 9 is actually x minus 3 quantity squared over x minus 3. Well, what that simplifies to is so long as x can't equal 3, is absolute value of x minus three. Now I wanna talk about this real quick. We have to kind of guarantee that x equal, can't equal three. And based off of our choice of delta, we don't really have to worry about that because delta can't be zero. Delta's gotta be bigger than zero, which means x, no matter what x value is gonna be in there, is not gonna be exactly three. X has to be something even just a teeny tiny bit bigger than three. But we've seen that x minus three before, of course, that's just x minus c. So in this case, we can fix epsilon greater than zero, and so long as I choose delta less than epsilon, literally any number, any single number I want for delta that's less than epsilon is gonna work. Because absolute value of x minus three less than delta means all this other stuff is still gonna work out. So 22 is a little bit easier, even though even though they try to throw you off by giving you a rational function, what looks like a rational function, uh, as far as the equation goes, if you simplify and do your algebra, it's actually not that bad. It's just the algebra, in this case, makes it look a little bit harder. 24 is the same thing. It looks a little bit different, so it looks like it's going to be hard. In this case, the limit of x as it approaches a for c is always equal to c. Basically, if you have a constant function, which would just be a horizontal line, uh, you're always going to just get that horizontal line. This one's not that bad, but again, the first step's always the same. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that x minus c less than delta implies f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Well, when I start plugging things in here, again, c in this case is just a, that's less than delta, but f of x minus l, that's just c minus c, which is just zero greater than epsilon. Well, 
again, if I fix epsilon greater than zero, that's always true. Because for all epsilon greater than zero, epsilon's got to be positive. It doesn't matter what I choose delta to be. So in this case, you literally choose any delta, and this is going to work out. Well, in this case, we'll choose delta greater, uh, delta less than epsilon, and then zero, which is less than x minus a, is less than delta, is less than epsilon. Now, how do we know zero is less than x minus a? We know that because this is an absolute value, and an absolute value has to be positive so long as x doesn't equal a. Well, we know x can't equal a because delta has to be positive too. So because zero is greater than absolute value of x minus a, which is uh, less than delta, we know that zero is less than epsilon, and the proof works again. Again, it looks complicated. It looks like it's more tricky, but once you do the algebra and then kind of do a little bit of the logic over here, it's not too bad. So 26 is the first one where you're going to have to get a little bit more involved into it. So this is a limit of x as it approaches zero for x cubed, and we want to show that that equals zero. Again, first step for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that x minus c less than delta implies f of x minus l less than epsilon. Plugging in our numbers, c in this case is zero, so at least that's nice for us. f of x is x cubed, and we need to show that's less than epsilon. A little bit of the rough work says, well, I need to show that absolute value of x cubed is less than epsilon. Well, I can cube root an absolute value, right? I can do that on both sides, and that kind of suggests that I need the absolute value to be less than the cube root of epsilon. Well, we know what absolute value of x minus 0 is. That's just absolute value of x. So fix epsilon greater than 0. Choose delta less than cube root of epsilon. And if I do that, then that means that my absolute value of x, which has to be positive because x can't equal 0, it's going to be less than delta, which is less than the cube root of epsilon. And then once again, based off of my rough work alone, cube, and that'll give me my f of x sine of the cell. Again, looks complicated. Not too bad when you actually uh, just start doing the algebra and you feel confident that you can do this absolute value of x is less than the cube root of epsilon. So that's it for our formal definition of the limit. Again, the most important part in all of these is going to be fixing, uh, you know, memorizing your definition. Got to memorize your definition in order to be able to use it. And then, of course, it's just a matter of doing that algebra. There are some more complicated examples, uh, especially if you're given quadratics and you have to factor those. And then you have to set delta less than a minimum. Uh, those ones can be a little bit more complicated, so just take your time. But again, that, those first two steps are always going to be the same. Use the definition, plug in your answer to the definition, and then start doing some rough work over there with your f of x minus l. Hope this was helpful. Uh, if you see anything that's wrong, please feel free to comment. Please feel free to point out how stupid I am. Talk about how ridiculous this definition are. All the other fun stuff. But most importantly, I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.